Hey guys, Savage Joy with Real Progressives. I am here tonight uh, joined by a fellow Pennsylvanian, uh, Chris Muller. Um, he is a veteran and also a cannabis activist, primarily for uh, veterans with PTSD. So thanks so much for joining us, Chris. You are thanks, a everybody. badass. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, you know, I'm doing what anybody else should be doing. If they see something and, you know, they say somebody should do something, maybe you're that person who should be doing something. No doubt. Absolutely. Um, so what branch of military were you in and what, um, like how long, okay, Army, <laughs> and how long and where did you serve and all that fun stuff? Uh, uh, well, I was in the reserves as an engineer, uh, U.S. Army. Um, as uh, a junior in high school. Uh, then I moved on from engineers to infantry uh, after a few years. And I had one tour in Iraq, which was 18 months with uh, the Striker Brigade out of Fort Lewis, Washington State. Um, I came home and uh, lost myself for a couple years. But, you know, I've regained uh, myself and found what I was, you know, supposed to do and helping veterans to heal and get better through cannabis. Absolutely. Um, you have something you refer to as a bud truck. My bud <laughs> like truck, yes. yes. Bud truck. Yes. <laughs> so yes. can you explain to everyone what that is and, and what you do with it? Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, hashtag bud truck. Bud truck being my pickup truck that I drive around. And it has 22 body bags in the back of it. And those 22 body bags represent veterans committing suicide every day on legal pharmaceuticals that are basically forced upon us. And I'm trying to bring light to the fact that cannabis is a safer alternative that veterans can turn to, that veterans should turn to, to combat you know, the opioid epidemic that's going on you know, the heroin, you know, fentanyl, all of it, you know, cannabis can save lives and, you know, it's helping to save mine. Right on. Um, what are some of the effects that, that you've had and seen others have when you started cannabis? Like, how did your life change? Um, was it gradual or was it immediate? For the most part, it, it wasn't like directly immediate. It was more progressive. You know, I, I found myself getting less angry, less, you know, and, uh, and more happy as, you know, as time went on, as I became a more frequent user um, and, you know, and then eventually becoming a cannabis patient. Um, and it's, you know, for me, it, it just basically helps me to overcome the anxiety, um, you know, the angst, the pain, depression, um, you know, that comes with uh, certain attributes of PTSD uh, and TBI, uh, which are uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and uh, uh, traumatic brain injury. So how did you, um, you said prior last night when we were talking that you didn't always smoke marijuana, you actually turned to worse things. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, it started with pills from the VA and then, you know, because that's, you know, you're supposed to trust in your doctors and they're supposed to have your best interest at heart. But, you know, uh, my doctor saw it, you know, that it, it is a problem. And, you know, the substances that I was prescribed were highly addictive. And I saw myself going down a very dark road. I decided to cut my losses and say, no, 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 I'm not going to go down there. I need to stop. And my doctor worked with me. I started, uh, you know, letting him know that I was medicating with cannabis. He didn't agree to the, the means, you know, he doesn't agree that smoking cannabis is the ideal, uh, you know, supply and use for cannabis, but the use of cannabis as a whole can be, uh, you know, medicinally uh, better. Right. I, ever since I asked you to come on, I've done a lot of research and, I mean, to me, it just seems I, kind of <laughs> exactly like if it helps you, why wouldn't you do it? Uh, 
And who am I hurting? Like, am I am I plotting some criminal act right now? No, I'm sitting in the comfortable, you know, environment of my own home, enjoying myself and having a wonderful conversation with you and hopefully the other 28 people who are joining us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't understand the whole, like, when people are against it because it doesn't affect them if you're doing that in your own home. It's and a historical propaganda against, uh, you know, a racial minority. And that's how it started. And, you know, a lot of damage can be done when you have that kind of a force backing you and uh, you have all the support of everybody agreeing with what you say, even to know it's false. You know, when you have a room full of yes men, damage gets done. You don't get progress. Absolutely. Um, so do you have a, at this point, do you, are you medically allowed to do this? or I have a cannabis card, a medicinal cannabis card from Oregon. Now, um, the date has expired. But as I understand it, your rights move forward. You don't get your rights taken away from. So I've established my right and need as a cannabis patient. Therefore, expiration dates should not have anything to do with it. <laughs> Excuse me. So have you ever been arrested or anything for it? You have. Mm -hmm. Was it prior to getting your card or? Yes, yes, yes. Gotcha. Or was with possession and uh, possession of per uh, paraphernalia. And so what, to... what is the outcome of that? I did probation. I mean, there wasn't like, they had like a little bit of dust in my grinder and that's what they tried to charge me with. But they didn't have enough to say that I was like supplying or, you know, distributing or anything like that. Right. Um, so, what's the, you said you used to do, um, you used to self-medicate with pills you were being just um, prescribed and stuff. What's the difference with your demeanor between that and how you are now? With When I was on pills, <clears throat> it seemed that I was much more gullible and I was more trusting of people because I was doped up. And, you know, then I um, to couple that with, you know, I was also drinking heavily at the time as well. And people would tend to use the fact that, you know, I was all doped up on pills to take advantage of me, you know, try to be my friend, um, you know, maybe very lethargic. Uh, and, you know, people robbed me of, like, you know, a lot of money because they pretended to be my friends just to get to the pills that I had. And, you know, uh, then they'll get to my money, you know, through that, too. Um, and it's just disgraceful, I guess. Do you think that you were more angry do you think you're more calm now? Now I'm, I'm far more calmer. I have a much better demeanor about myself. Um, you know, I'm not hateful. You know, I'm not filled with hate. I'm not filled with anger. I am much more relaxed and easygoing. That's awesome. Now, what gave you the idea to do the bun track? Like, I get the symbolism of the, the 22 body bags and stuff, but what actually inspired you to do that? Honestly, um, the want to do something to get in people's faces, to give them a shock and awe type of a campaign where they couldn't just look away. They can't just, you know, pass the homeless guy on this corner anymore. You know, there is something there blocking your path. You have to look at that. And once you do, you can't unsee it. Absolutely. And it's not something I talk about a lot, but unfortunately my cousin, as I told you, was one of those 22. Yes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a wake up call. Um, cause he was only 27. So it's a wake up call when, when you see these statistics, like 22 a day, as you and I discussed privately earlier, it probably is more than that. Oh, and, it's far more. The, the, they only yeah. have, I think it's between 13 and nine. It depends on what statistics you're trying to look at. You have between 13 and 19 states 
actually keeping records and track of what's going on, not just within the VA, but within a state system as well. Now, the numbers actually triple this. The issue is, is that we don't have enough recognition. And part of my, my bug truck campaign is to seek out constitutional protection, therefore, that you know veterans would be a selected group protected by the United States Constitution that we fight for and the rights of everybody else therein. Absolutely. Um, also, I think the problem with statistics, like you say 22 a day, even if that were accurate, you're not talking about all the family members, the friends, everything. You're just putting a number on it. And there's so much pain that went into each one of those people who decided to, you know, end their life. And it's, it could have been prevented. Oh, absolutely. And In my opinion, you know, all the, you know, the legislators, the congressmen, the senators, you know, each and every one of them, every single day has the greatest opportunity to make the best choices and, and make the best decisions for millions of people to have the best health care, the best education, you know, the best, you know, feeling of security and they don't do it out of personal greed you know it's all about money it's all about what goes into their pocket as opposed to what goes into the life expansion of your people i totally agree it's i mean what it comes down to is if you know even let's say in pennsylvania our our uh, cons um you know our mayor or governor do they care enough to sit down and speak one on one with veterans? Ask them what would help you? What do you need? Of course not. No, no, because they don't want to have an open discussion where they can be made a fool of in a public forum where everybody can see them. And then they can get all red faced and say, well, that wasn't on our agenda because it didn't have a profit margin that fit our budget. You know, if, you, if at any point in time you're speaking about, you know, health care and taking care of your people, if you're not talking about taking care of everybody, you know, on a universal scale, which can be done, we just got to start cutting the ends of the rich people who obviously don't give a right to ask about the guy on the bottom enough. Mm -hmm. um, someone actually just asked... Um if you've been able to meet with any congressmen? No, I have not, uh, nor have I really, you know, made any scheduled plans to do so. Um, I would like to, but I highly doubt that they would want to. I, you know, I'm in Harrisburg, so I live right by all those gems and their offices, and uh, they know me <laughs> from going there and calling they're not always receptive. Oh, no, I, no, they won't be. I've yet to receive any responses. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I absolutely encourage everyone watching everything to um, go on like change.org and things like that and try to find petitions. Um, somebody else just said that even though Cory Booker is a, a pretty much a douchebag, I guess he's doing... Um, he's doing something with legalization, um, a marijuana bill. Um, so you can take a look at that as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's there's people like Senator Sanders who are pushing for legalization. Also, because you have countless people in jail because of something so stupid. Stupid and insignificant. You're made a criminal by the law, not by the action. Okay, you're made a criminal by that law. So mm -hmm. all it is is, oh, we we don't have enough of a leeway to arrest you for simply owning the plant. Everything about it has to be illegal. Mm -hmm. They create criminals to suit their needs. It's that simple. They needed to do it during prohibition because people had a certain belief. You know, you know, uh, for alcohol. Now we've got, you know, an 80 year going prohibition against cannabis. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, you know, and this is not a, a huge epiphany or anything, but it is kind of just incredible that you, you know, you have pills, which 
can be mass prescribed and you have something that's completely like, you know, earthy and growing out of the ground and natural. And it's looked at as something just way more harsh and put it's something man-made. That's all it is. It's a history of propaganda. That's the best way to put it. It's uh, it's hate mongering, fear mongering, you know, uh, self born terrorism, you know, brought upon our people, you know, and not just American people, but people of the human race over a plant. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't, I know um, my other uh, team members from Real Progressives know this, and my friends are laughing hysterically right now because I'm doing this interview because. I made Chris aware yesterday that I've actually never done pot in my life. So there's the, the irony. However, I would like it to be legalized. I'm totally open. I'm totally all for it. Um, it's just, uh, you know, the, the smell doesn't work for me. <laughs> well, you, can, you can vape. You can vape. There's other means of using cannabis other than just smoking it. There's topicals, there's ointments, there's uh, capsules. I mean, you know, there's all sorts of ways to get that you can use it. And it's to each and own individual to find the best means for themselves that is safe. Now, what about CBD oil? Because I know people use that for um, cancer, seizures, things like that. So is smoking just a preference you have or do you find it works better? Um, the CBD is more on the like is, is like really 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 on the medicinal side in combating some of the uh, you know the issues that you've mentioned you know and so many more um, you know think about having Lyme disease and how that you know really you know affects you uh, and the nervous system you know that helps to combat that that issue as well um, you know it's uh, and it helps out with your cannabinoid receptors to help combat other things within your own body. So it, it really is, I'm not going to say a miracle drug, but it definitely has its uses, you know, not just medicinally, but, you know, for many, many facets in living, uh, you know, your day to day. Absolutely. I, you're brave. I know you're modest. I know. I get it. Every time I tell you you're a badass, you're like, it's okay. No, you're a badass. I'm just, yes, I'm just, you, you know, I, I'm a grunt, you know, I'm a soldier. And, you know, you can either live by and, and, and stand by and just watch things happen, or you can try to do something about it, and I'm trying to do something about it. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I only know what I can do, and it's that I take action upon. Right on. Absolutely. I was reading, um, I found an article that said that uh, New Mexico and Maine allow the VA hospitals to prescribe medical marijuana for uh, soldiers with PTSD. Um, do you know anything about that? Um, I've read things about it. Uh, I haven't really read too much about the Mexican side. Uh, I have, however, read about the Maine and how they have a, uh, um, uh, an opioid program to help get veterans off of heroin. Um, it's like a camp, which is, I think is a very great I idea and it's not just veterans, but it's also civilians as well. And it's just, you know, that's great. Cause you know, you're supporting each other. It's not something that is, uh, you know, totally regulated because we have to figure out ourselves how to work out our issues. You know, you're not, you're not, when you go there, you don't have the label and the record of being a criminal. You're just one person going in there and they are helping you because they know the struggle. Absolutely. Do you have um, other veteran friends where you live that you can reach out to if you're ever having like a, a panic attack or anything like that? Oh yes, I you know I have a, a group of friends that I try to keep with. Um, you know, they're based around you know uh, you know uh, a veteran murder club group that I've I've worked with, and I'm trying to build off the ground. That's awesome. Um, and um, the consensus on things I looked up seemed to be um, that approximately 20% of veterans uh, returning from Iraq and Afghanistan are diagnosed with PTSD. 
Um, and if 20% might not sound like a huge amount, but that's actually ginormous. Like that's a well, lot of people. Well, it's, it's a uh, huge number. Yeah. Uh, I can't say that I agree with, you know, the reasons why we've been placed into the conflicts that we have been. Um, I don't believe that, you know, we need to be there. Um, I spent time there. I'm not an expert. I'm nobody. I'm a Joe Schmo veteran. And, you know, my opinion is my opinion. And I don't believe that we have any reason to be over there and doing what we're doing other than greed. And it's not greed by the everyman. It's the top, what, 2%? Yes, top 1% per Bernard. <laughs> we are the 99 fucking percent. Right. We're the, what we the people. That's who sh they should be fighting for. You know, I mean, go ahead. We're, I mean, that's the beauty of, you know, our channel and, and so many Facebook pages and everything is we have, you know, a progressive group and a progressive voice. And they can only stifle it for so long. We're awake, we're knowledgeable, and we're, you know, we're on our feet. We have boots to the pavement. We're acting. Um, so, you know, you're one of those who's actually fighting. It's, it's easy when you're going through shit to just be like, oh my God, I'm just gonna lay in bed. And you can't blame someone when they do that. but. Yeah, but you're taking the opposite route and you're taking what you've been through and actually using it to help others. Um, I know you've done um, some speeches and everything at um, festivals and stuff. Do you want to talk about that? Um, well, most recently, um, I was in uh, Lancaster for uh, Lancaster Normal and Pittsburgh Normal. They had an event at the Village uh, in Lancaster. And I just did a quick speech. My truck was outside on display for anyone who wanted to take a photograph of it. And um, you know, I was just there to help support them and to get the message across that you know, cannabis you know, is a medicine. Cannabis can save lives. Um, a few weeks back, I attended the Boston Freedom Rally. Um, and you know, my truck was on display in Boston Commons um, for like the first two days. And then Sunday, it was on the main road. Uh, you know, for, you know, what was it, 120,000 total people were there that weekend, you know, have the opportunity to see it. And then uh, through, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, Philly Normal and, you know, the normal uh, national nationwide, uh, MassCan, uh, Neva, you know, I was able to uh, get an opportunity to go on stage and speak, you know, a few times about the truck, about the cause and the need for, you know, the use of cannabis and protection of veterans. That is so amazing. Um, the Something that kept coming up during my research was the, the term um, invisible illness. And I've heard that for years with, you know, um, any bipolar, depression, schizophrenia, anything like that. And do you find that it's difficult because people, by looking at you per se, they don't know that you may have, um, you know, PTSD. Um, so does it's it- It's the same for everybody. I mean, you don't know the homeless guy, you know, that you're passing by on the street might have schizophrenia or, you know, he might be bipolar or, you know, psychotic. And, it's basically you're getting given a stigma. You know, as soon as somebody brings up the word veteran, there's two ways that you go about it. You either think, oh, honorable, nice guy or crazy lunatic. And most times people think crazy lunatic when the word veteran comes up or combat veteran, especially. And this is nothing new. Veterans have been dealing with, you know, this stigma, you know, with shell shock, battle fatigue, you know, since, you know, World War One, And it's, you know, because we're not supposed to be you know, in combat. These are things that the human body is not supposed to be undertaking. You know, the, the washing of people getting blown up and, you know, sitting through IEDs and explosions and all that stuff. You know, the human body isn't built nor conditioned for such, you know, uh, atrocities. 
Absolutely. What um, inspired you to go into the army? Uh, my family, you know, more of a more of a tradition, honoring you know my family's tradition. Do you ever regret it? No, no, I don't regret you know serving my country. What I regret is you know the lies, the betrayal, and the deceit, you know, uh, force fed onto myself. Um, and other soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, just so that we can keep a war going to keep somebody rich. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, we've, you know, we went into a war because they said that, you know, oh, they have weapons of mass destruction. And they, you know, came up with evidence of ricin. And, and yet, where have we discovered any of the supposed weapons of mass destruction? Where have we, you know, exposed... You know, the things that we were told we're going to find and are going to be a major threat, you know, and and if they are found, why are we covering them up? I mean, if these are the reasons that we're going to war, why not tell the public, hey, this is what we found? Instead, no, we're going to cover it up, ship it somewhere else so we have another reason to go to another country because they're not taking our American dollars. Yeah, it's very eye-opening when you there's there's so many people who consider themselves patriotic who just think you know we're going to war and it's because we need to and when you sit down and analyze everything you realize we don't need to be doing half the shit we're doing and it's creating so many deaths that don't need to happen do you um when it comes to, I mean, I know the past two days on everyone's mind is obviously Las Vegas. When a tragedy like that happens, as someone with PTSD, I mean, it's hard for all of us to comprehend, but how with, and I apologize if this is too invasive, but how does that, how do you deal with that? Um. My view is rather skewed. Um, I am a believer of false flag operations and the fact that, you know, yes, a tragedy tragedies may occur and, you know, lives may have been lost, but I will not deny the fact that it may have been planned out. You know, when we go to war, death is planned. Like, you know, it's an inevitability when we get you know, hit by IEDs and you know, RPGs, firefights, you know, it's an inevitability. And we have to deal with it and move on. Otherwise, our mission has failed, you know, as, as grunt soldiers on the ground. And, you know, I'm not going to say that, you know, there haven't been 53 other examples of black flag, um, uh, you know, uh, false flag operations um, that have, you know, tried to turn us against somebody else for no particular reason other than profit. Yes, I have, I have heard um, others on land saying that as well. Um, um, what are some of the things that we can do as viewers and as people who are watching? What can we do to help legalize marijuana, especially medicinally? Contact your local state representatives, your local congressmen, um, Anybody and everybody that you think might be able to help turn this around and feed them, force feed them the truth. You know, uh, go to their offices. I, I don't want to say harass, but definitely go there and piss them off enough that we have to force them into making actions and moves in the positive manner in which we truly want. Um, I don't remember ever getting a say in how much tobacco can be pushed in my face, uh, you know, or where it can be advertised or you know, where alcohol can be pushed upon us or how much illegal alcohol can be pushed upon us. Uh, I'm not getting asked about the pharmaceutical pills that people want to just keep throwing at us. As long as, you know, at the end of the commercial, they, you know, say, oh, well, this is a list of side effects that might affect you. Uh, you know, it's a laundry list of things. And we're supposed to accept it because we're supposed to trust the doctors who are getting paid to basically force pills on us. And when you look at um, the numbers from um, states who have 
legalized marijuana, it's incredible the amount of um, arrests have gone down tremendously. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, the arrests go down for like the individual, say like, you know, they're uh, just catching somebody walking down the street for a random search, as opposed to them actually doing raids on the dispensaries, the, uh, the growers, um, the people who are trying to do things legally. You know, we have too many cocks on the walk on this. And with most laws, you know, you've got, you've got um, you know, sheriffs who enforce, you know, uh, certain county laws. You've got town laws. You've got state laws, federal laws. You know, we've got so many people in law enforcement looking over our shoulder and trying to regulate and take away from our pocket that it's hard for anybody to really know what they're supposed to do and how to do it correctly because so many people are picking at you. So it's, it's not necessarily the individual getting picked up any more than it is. They're doing it on a larger scale. So they have more to present for a budgetary committee for next year that says, Oh, we need more money because we keep making drug arrests. They don't define the drug arrest as being strictly cannabis. They're not looking out for the, you know, the heroin uh, producers, the pill mills, um, the, the fentanyl, and, uh, you know, all the, the other harder drugs where they're being produced and shipped in. You know, they're worried about cannabis because that's an easy way in. It's an easy victim to point and say, yes, those are the bad people. Wow, that I did not know. It makes sense. Yes. Yeah. It's, all, it's all about money. Dollars and cents in the end. Always. Wow. Um how can people get in touch with you if they are having an event and they want you to speak or they have questions or anything like that? Uh, my Facebook is public, you know, Chris Muller. Uh, you can find me at Combat Canavet on Instagram. Um, you know, also uh, Reckless Murder uh, Veterans Club is, uh, you know, my veterans group that I'm heading up as president and minister uh, to try to help, you know, build the, a broader community of veterans based around, you know, all types of vehicles. Um, you know, just, just message me, you know, let's make sure everything is on the up and up and legitimate. And, you know, I'll make my way out there if I can. Awesome. I found um, a website that actually was, was pretty awesome when I was researching. Um, it's called maketheconnection.net. Um, and there's a lot of resources on there for anyone watching um it gives the um signs and symptoms of ptsd also um how to reach out for help um testimonials different treatments all kinds of things and i definitely want um sorry <laughs> thinking about my cousin um Hello. I think, you can take a moment if you need. You can take a moment. It's okay. Um, I think it's important to also um, give out the Veterans Crisis Line, um, which is 1-800-273-8255. Um, and press 1, or you can actually text for help at 838-255. Um, and both of those are open 24 seven. Um, and if you want, um, people to walk away with one thing, um, a lot of more things to keep note of, <laughs> <laughs> like what is your, um, if, what's your key takeaway from this interview? Like if, what do you want people to keep in mind? Before I get to that, um, I just want to bring up two quick points um, uh -huh. that, you know, part of my hashtag, you know, uh, Bud Truck, uh, you know, movement, it is also to bring attention to the fact that uh, veterans, you know, need, uh, you know, constitutional protection so that we can combat some of the stigma that is being a veteran. And in doing so, we will help to end the crisis in the VA you know, that is all the malignant care, the malpractices, you know, allowing us to die. 
as well as getting veterans off the streets and making it a crime to allow men who serve your country to end up that way. And in not every instance is it that man's fault that they ended up on the streets. You know, some choose that life. Others, they end up that way from making choices um, that, you know, have devastated their lives. But those choices might have been made to help deal with and cope with what they have suffered during their military service. Not saying that all of them are in that, in that particular order. But by providing veterans constitutional protection, we're you know, hindering others from committing atrocities against a regular Joe Schmo veteran. If a veteran is, you know, uh, a homeless veteran is beaten up and, you know, robbed, he's just a homeless guy getting beaten up and robbed. You know, as opposed to, say, a policeman getting beaten up and robbed, that's almost national news now. You know, him serving a, a city or a community means more than a man who has served his country. Um, another point I would like to bring up is, uh, you know, historical reconciliation. And what I mean by that is, um, in our previous wars and conflicts, you know, uh, you know Korea, Vietnam, uh, World War II, you know, we have been able to go back to those countries and reconcile more or less with the battlefields in which, you know, our, our former warriors had fought upon and lost their own brethren. And I feel that, you know, we as Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, we will not be afforded that, that opportunity to, you know, lay our hands upon our, our old battlefields and have an end, you know, like a complete closure to, uh, to what is, you know, in some parts of us, you know, the best and worst parts of ourselves. Um, and I, you know, that's, you know, part of, I think what, uh, is what is a big issue as to how veterans, uh, can deal with the atrocity that is, you know, uh, PTSD and, uh, you know, the conflict that it is. Absolutely. Um, Mark, Fabian, or I'm sorry, Fabian, I'm not sure, Mark, um, he, he's a fellow real progressive on our team, and he said his brownies are killer. <laughs> oh, Mark. Um, and, uh... Oh, okay. And then Allison said her brother-in-law's uh, neighbor makes gummies. I've heard of uh, these things. Um, um, Allison wants to know what's next. For me or for what? Maybe I'm more specific. Yeah, for you. Like, what? what's next on the agenda? Well, like, coming up, I'm going to be showing up at the... Uh, the Phillies game on this coming Sunday on the 8th. I'm trying to find a good uh, spot where I can park the bud truck, get maximum exposure because it's going to be a lot of people, and try to, you know, get people's attention. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, I don't watch sports. I don't watch football or baseball or anything like that. Um, you know, uh, I believe that the athletes of today are no different than the gladiators of old. They're just a distraction from uh, – all the things that should matter, and you guys just want to pay attention to that. Uh, that's my opinion. You know, uh, you can hold me to it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm definitely more interested in activists than than somebody hitting a baseball. But I mean, that's me, <laughs> so I get it. <laughs> um, so, and um, I when. You, I saw that when you posted that, that you also said you wouldn't be going inside. Um, no, once you get in, you kind of like trap parked inside. And yeah. I don't want to do that. I, like, if when I, I'll have my dog, so when I need to leave, I need to leave. And uh, there's no bathrooms out there, so I got to find places to do my business. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, it is what it is. Oh, so you do have a service dog? Uh, he's my emotional support dog, yeah. yeah. Aww. His That's name's awesome. Ruffles. He's a uh, red nosed pit bull, uh, American Brindle, and a Rottweiler. Aw, uh, what's his name? Reckless. <laughs> that is perfect. <laughs> I might be able to get him over here if he's awake. Reckless, come here, buddy. Come here. Come on. 
Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh, hi, cutie. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh, what a cutie. Oh, what a sweetheart. Is there anything else um, you'd like to add or any, any last thoughts? Um, oh, yes, to get back to what I want people to take away from this. Uh, you know, stand up for your rights. You know, uh, keep talking to people. Keep spreading the word. You know, share the videos. Share this. Um, talk to your friends. Don't be afraid to, you know, voice your opinion. But make sure your opinion is in a progressive move, you know, so that it's, it's something that's going to help others. If you're, you know, just trying to spew hate speech and separate people, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to go far. You need to be able to make sure that you're being accepting of everybody's point of view, but making sure his point of view go in the same direction. And that's forward for not just us as a, as a nation, as Americans, but as people, as human beings. I totally agree. Just shut up and take it. You're a badass. I don't want to hear anything. You're yeah. a badass. No, no. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining me. And um, when I decided to, instead of just interview, you know, people running for things and. and oh, oh, running. Yes. I'm running for oh, president yeah. in 2020. Yes. See, I want to be the president that sets precedence because the week of the election, I actually am legally eligible that week by age. So as soon as I turn, you know, what, 36, I'm, I'm right in. And so I want to be the president that sets precedence. I'm going to bring beards back to the White House. Yes. You know? We're going to have a good time. We're going to have a good time. I think with the beard, you should have a monocle and an ascot and just – yeah, that's that's that. I'm bringing <laughs> kilts too. Kilts to the White House. What's that? Kilts. Oh yes, yes, right on, absolutely. <laughs> the Secret well, Service are going to have to shave their heads and get oh. a beard so they can match me. It'll yes, be fun. I would proudly wear your face on a shirt. Wonderful. <laughs> 46. <laughs> well, you were actually the first person when I decided I was going to interview a few activists. You were the first person I reached out to. Thank you. Because I, it's something everyone needs to hear more about. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. And thanks to all the viewers. Um, and this live broadcast will be saved um, so you can share it and go back and watch later as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. You're you. awesome. Take care. Bye. Bye.